and what's reimbursable. So if you're still, if you go positive on the stress test, they will order an angiogram. Now we're talking $1,000 to $3,000 to confirm any positive stress test. So the X-ray CTA is, is an X-ray that's rotating at 100 APM around you, and it's scary when you're inside one of these things. And uh, the X-ray creates a three-dimensional image for the cardiologist to look at and diagnose actually what's going on in your arteries. And it gives them also what they call a calcium score. If there's calcium building up in your arteries, it shows that. The option two, which is still the gold standard, is a catheter-based angiogram. They stick a catheter in through your groin or your arm. How it depends on your physical build, whichever one they use. They inject a radio wave opaque dye and they take a fluoroscope, which is just an X-ray movie picture. And they can see the heart pumping and the blood flowing and or being restricted. So option two is the gold standard, but there's a big competition going on between one and two right now. Do you do CTA or you'd go right to angiogram? Now there's a school of thought, oh, and if you're still positive, then they intervene. Lifestyle, statins, stents, bypass, anyone that is appropriate. Now there's a school of thought, not only are option one at odds in the market, one and two at odds in the market, but there's a, there's a struggle going on now that a lot of cardiologists who are so-called minimalists will say, all I need is number two, functional testing. I can tell you just as well as an expensive image that this person is really sick just by looking at the, at the damage that's indicated in an EKG. You can look at the echocardiograph and say, well, it's the valve, it's not working right, you're, you're getting symptoms that are similar, and the stress tells you whether the blood is getting to the heart. The perfusion of blood into the heart muscle is critical. So those three things tell a lot of people healthcare doesn't need to bear the burden of expensive imaging techniques. And in fact, NIH took this so seriously that in 2015 to 2017, they did a huge clinical trial. The Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute of the National Institutes of Health paid for this. And it went on for two years. And the trial objective was to tell whether or not number two in the previous slide, the stress, EKG, echocardiogram, is as good as or is it inferior to the anatomical test, CTA. And they worked that trial with 5,000. And at the end of two years, they looked at the outcomes of these 10,000 people who were randomly selected into the two groups. No difference. If the initial strategy was expensive imaging, it didn't make any difference, we really know in this country how to intervene with somebody who has heart disease. If you have it and you're under good health care, you're in good hands. The problem is then, you have to be symptomatic with either chest pain, pain or shortness of breath to get into that good health care that we have through intervention. I'm not sure what happened. my text here. So the takeaway, I'll just state it. The takeaway from the PROMISE trial was that if you present with symptoms, 
you get good health care. And the reason that happened is that it costs so much to go beyond and screen for heart disease. There's no way to screen for coronary artery disease that's a reasonable cost. That's the takeaway. And if we could screen for heart disease starting at, say, age 20, once a year when you go in for your physical, if there was a cheap way to see if your arteries are clean, and you did that every year, and you had a history of whether or not you had blockages in your arteries, that would be a big help in improving your outcomes for heart disease. Because you'd be told sooner that you should change your lifestyle or maybe you should go on statins at age 30. A lot of people are recommending that. So what's a cheap way to screen for CAD? We think we have it. This little company that I formed in 2008, this is the fifth generation of an array of stethoscopes. So this device is about three and a half inches. This, these are the stethoscopes right here, and there are 15 of them. Each one of them constitutes an independent point at measuring the vibration produced by the sound that comes to the chest right over your heart. Basically, this is the new stethoscope. I don't know when you'll see it, but hopefully soon. And it fits right over intercostal stage four with 15 stethoscopes. And that's that section there where you can count the 15 bands. I don't know why. Is there any reason, Rick, why the photos, because I can see them here, but they're not projecting. See what? Yeah. Well, there's the title. Oh it's I it's sh it's sh it's showing the title, but it's not showing the figure. I think I should. It it is in a slideshow. Yeah. Let's get out of that. Okay. So it's the slideshow transfer that's causing this. Yeah. Does this bother anybody? Okay. We've got to stay in kind of the PowerPoint mode here. Okay, so what we're at, what we're, to get back to the subject here, what we're proposing is that if we just simply listen to the heart like a stethoscope, we can, at very young age, begin to monitor for heart disease. And, and there's a precursor to this the stethoscope, which was has been around for 100 years, probably. This is the Littmann Model 3. Everyone has one if they're a legitimate medical person, and it hangs around their neck. And it's a passive listening device, but it's not a sonar device. But it does something similar to what we want to do, which is to hear blood flow turbulence. We've all had the doctor come in and put the stethoscope on the side of our neck and listen to the carotid artery. And at the branch point, there is a tendency for the carotid artery to fill up with gunk. There's no other word for it. I mean, it's a collection of lipids that get grow into and penetrate into the artery wall. And it, it makes it sound like ch, ch, ch. The French called that a brew, a noise made by blood flow.
So I'm going to do a little history here. Let's go back to Leonardo da Vinci, who discovered sonar, what a principle that makes sonar work. Leonardo in 1490 said, if you put your ear to a tube and drop it into the water, you can hear a ship at a great distance. The beginning of sonar. In 1826, John Strutt, I love that name, who became known as Lord Rayleigh, who formulated the Rayleigh wave equation for the way sound propagates, was sitting in his boat thinking about the wave equation and also measuring for the very first time the speed of sound in water. And also the speed of sound in the human body at higher frequencies. That's why ultrasound works. At low frequencies, though, the body is not water. It's tissue and flexible material. It's elastic. And there's a different wave equation application for that. So on the medical side, what was going on about the time of Lord Rayleigh was he invented the, the stethoscope, and it looked like a, a piece of wood that he probably carved one night sitting in front of the television. And he put, put the end of the tube where he wanted to listen inside the body and the other end to his ear, and lo and behold, the stethoscope was born, and there is a patent. So, 200 years later, submarines are out there, and I can't say, I can say virtually nothing about the submarine, other than there are over 100,000 passive, or 100, 1,000 listening devices on the submarine, 1,000 hydrophones. What has the stethoscope turned into today, to today? The AUM Corporation had on the market for a little while a smart stethoscope. And why was it smart? Because it was digital and it had the ability to use artificial intelligence and knowledge, prior knowledge, to diagnose sound. That's what it had. So let's look at the stethoscope the history of the stethoscope, and point something out here. Rene had a stethoscope that had a hearing piece on it, down in this area here, that was about an inch, as far as I can tell, about an inch in diameter. The Littmann Model 3 has a diaphragm that's about an inch and a half, still just a single listening transducer. Guess what? The smart stethoscope built under the bottom here has about an inch and a half listening diaphragm. So the aperture hasn't changed in over 200 years, more than 50%. It's gotten a little bit bigger, and all this digital signal processing and artificial intelligence and deep learning, it's made a minor, a minor improvement. But if you can't sense the true sound field, you're always going to be limited. And that's why the AUM company went bankrupt. Because the market wasn't there for just a remake of the Littman III. And here's how the smart stethoscope failed. The probability of a true positive using the Littman to diagnose CAD is 0.8. You can read this curve. This is the probability that if a person has CAD, that the, that the diagnosis will be correct using the smart stethoscope is about 0.8. So these are probabilities, probability of a true positive. So the other side of it is the probability of a false positive. The person does not have CAD, and 30% of the time, the person will be diagnosed with CAD which is even worse than missing it, because it triggers an escalation of invasion, intrusion into the body. Catheters, radiation. So you don't want to be a victim of false positive CAD diagnosis. 
And when that came out of this data, which was published, within six months, the company had folded. People know what that means. In healthcare, you don't want to make a mistake. Okay, so the problem with the coronary artery disease condition is that the amount of turbulence generated in a coronary artery, which are only about four millimeters inside diameter, the carotid artery can be six, seven millimeters inside diameter. So it's got four times the capacity to transfer blood. Your brain uses a lot of blood, that much more than the heart. But for a carotid artery, it's too deep, it's too small, and there are ambient noise sources around the artery like valves that are constantly providing an ambient background. So you can't hear turbulence in the carotid arteries like you can with, I mean, in the coronary arteries like you can with the carotid artery. So what does sonar bring to this attempt to diagnose coronary artery turbulence caused by a blockage? It brings something called a spectrogram. It brings another tool called focused listening, which is made possible by the array of stethoscopes that we talked about, and I'll sort of give you an overview of that technique in a moment. And it brings time averaging, statistical time averaging. In other words, we can listen and record heartbeats for two minutes. We can get 100 heartbeats, and we can look across that ensemble something that somebody listening through a stethoscope doesn't have the power to do. We can't remember and integrate over 100 heartbeats. You hear them one at a time. And there's a lot of statistical benefits from that in improving the quality of, of the information we can derive. So I'm going to go through these one, one at a time, these tools, and then I'll show you applications of them. So what is a spectrogram? Spectrogram is a displayed output of an app that performs a continuous analysis of frequencies and presents them to the observer. So if I can remember what my granddaughter told me last night. Okay, here's a spectrogram running, listening to the sound in this room. See the clapping? Let me try and make a sound like a heart. And what does everybody think of when they think of the sound of a heart? Lub, dub, right? Those are valve closures. So I'll do lub, dub, and then I'm going to add a sound of heart disease. Lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub. Here comes the heart disease. Lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub, Love dub ch, love dub ch. Boy, I can't see it. Can you? Oh, there's one. I'll have to do a louder ch. Told you it's quiet. Love dub ch. Is my angle bad? What's, what's going on here? Love dub ch. Love dub Love dub ch, love dub ch, love dub ch. Can you see the ch or not? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll show you some real data. We have human data, even though this demonstration didn't work like it did last night. Okay. Uh, it doesn't take much to make me want to play the fiddle. So, and it fascinates me to see it this way. So let me try it.
sound of a violin. And the first time I saw it, it fascinated me so much. And let me squeeze that. You can see the note changes, the frequency content. This is the called the fundamental down along in here. Fundamental and the first harmonic. So if that was a D, it was, a, it was around 500 hertz, and this was about one kilohertz. Yeah? And you can see the note change. But the harmonics in a good violin are so critical. Any wooden instrument, the whole case vibrates, and those modes of vibration create those higher frequencies. Um, and the heart is the same way. The heart is something that produces a lot of harmonics, in fact, so many harmonics, and there are so many fundamentals in a broadband shh sound that you see energy almost continuously across frequency uh, with time. Now, even though my shh didn't come through too well, that's where you hear heart disease. In the diastolic interval after the dub, blood flow increases in the coronary arteries up to the point at about the 25% mark in the diastolic interval where the flow is a maximum and the turbulence and the turbulent noise would be a maximum. So let's get out of this. So we did the spectrogram. What was the next tool I talked about? Yes, sure can. The way, to, the way to discriminate between the lub-dub and the shh in diastole is just notch it in time, okay? You gate, yeah. Because we know that blood flow in the coronary arteries is exclusive to the di diastolic interval, at least high-level blood flow. There's always blood in, in the coronaries, but, but it peaks about, at the, as I said, about one quarter of the way into diastole. So that's the time you want to focus on. And what we do is we strobe out that interval for as many heartbeats as we can get in two minutes. That can be 110, it can be 50. Systolic, the systolic interval or systole is when the heart is pumping. It's after the lub and before the dub. So the ventricles are contracting blood is coming out into the body. When the dub occurs, the mitral valve shuts and the tricuspid valve shut on the right side of the heart and the heart starts to refill. And the heart muscle is relaxed at that point. And that decompresses the coronary arteries right on the front of the ventricle and it allows blood to flow. So that's why diastole Diastole is, is the time we listen. So you're looking for very low flow well, it's not, it's not that low. It can, it can, reach, can reach 100 milliliters per, per second. Yeah. For We're listening for turbulence. Absolutely. And because velocity is a maximum at about the quarter of the way into diastole, that's where we want to concentrate. Okay, I got two more tools I got to get over, and some. How are we doing on time? Exactly. I'm having so much fun here that I. Okay, what is focused listening beamforming? Okay, we have all these stethoscopes out on the chest, fifteen of them. Suppose we could focus that aperture, that fifteen stethoscope aperture, all over the heart, and estimate what the power at each, the intensity of, of the noise power at each one of these points that I'll describe here. Let's actually look at how that's done. And I'm not going to use equations here. I'm going to try and make you understand it intuitively. So we have, we have 15 stethoscopes. We don't really use stethoscopes. We use a material called polyvinyl. Chloride, and it's just a vinyl sheet 
flexible vinyl sheet that's embedded with a piezoelectric dust. And piezoelectric is, if you squeeze it, you stretch it, you distort it, it makes a voltage. And if you measure the voltage from one side of the vinyl to the other, you're actually measuring the motion of the material and the voltage that's produced as a result of that. So this is one stethoscope one of these little strips. And there, it's a miniaturized stethoscope. And when we realized we could make a stethoscope that small, we said, we can do 15 of those and we have a sonar system. It's passive. Yeah. And we're down below a kilohertz here. Yep, it's, they use this in side look. Yeah, and other places. Okay, so what makes this work? Let's suppose we want to listen to a point in space. And we know its coordinates. And if we know the coordinates in x, y, z, we can calculate the what's called the Euclidean distance, or just the length d1 and d2 from each of two stethoscopes. All right, so we know these two distances because they're part of our program. We tell it, I want to listen here, all right? You know D1 and D2, and you know how far apart the stethoscopes, the stethoscopes are, one and two. So when we know three sides of the triangle, this is called a triangulation problem. Now, suppose we took this point with a big, big computer, and we did 125,000 of them to interrogate the power that occurs at all points in the volume around the heart. And we create an image, a map of that energy in pixels. What we've just done is we focused, we focused this array to a point of interest. And we can do that because we know D1 and D2 and we can calculate the time difference along this differential path for each pair of sensors in this 15 element array. And how many pairs are there? If there are 15, then there's 15 squared over two possible triangles that we can average. This is where the concept of ensemble averaging comes in. I can solve the triangulation problem 225 over two times and average all this. Because I have 225 different pairs. So that's something called focused beamforming. And we can do it with that device between all of the different pairs. We're working the triangulization problem between each pair, one, two, one, three, one, four. And you can do that in a computer in the blink of a, an I mean faster. And you can do it at all the frequencies that you want to listen to. Um, this reminds me of a famous, or an infamous cousin that I have, apparently, or I had. His name was Owsley Stanley. And I found this uncanny when I learned this. Owsley Stanley was the inventor of the wall of sound that the Grateful Dead started to use in the late 60s and all through the 70s and 80s. And you can't go to a music festival in this day and age without a stack of speakers. That for the, the bass, they're like the woofers, they're like 10, 12, 15 feet high. And then the higher frequencies are a little shorter stack. And, and my illustrious cousin knew all about that. You see this stack here, it must be, it must be 40 feet tall of woofers. Here's the high frequency stuff over here. I have to zoom in on that. Anyhow, that's Jerry Garcia with him, who was with the dead back in the 70s and 80s. Unfortunately, my famous cousin was known as the LSD chemist, inventor of the big white O that was used a lot in San Francisco in those days. So just a little side issue there.
And I had no idea this guy, but it's funny that he was working in sound. And if you turn my de this device on its side, it's a wall of microphones. And it just so happened we were working on similar acoustic technology uh, when he was still alive. I guess he, I think he died. He married an Australian person and, and moved to Australia and drove his car off the road. I wonder where his brain was at the time. Quite a guy, though, if you read his story. Um, moving on. And the last tool I'm not going to spend much time on before I go to some real data, um, time averaging, or the general notion of ensemble averaging. The longer we can listen to something that's repeating, even though there's noise all around, time allows us to beat down the noise and hear the thing that's repeating itself better and better. All right, so here's how it works. Here's a photograph of a four millimeter thick slice of the human body right through the center of the heart looking down from the top. And we use the left chest to place our device. So we place it right out here between intercostal space, intercostal space four, which is just above the nipple. You've got to get through fat, you've got to get through muscle, and a little bit of lung tissue. Okay, so the medium isn't what they would call homogeneous. It's a messy propagation path that we have to deal with. And there are techniques for that. But you can still preserve the energy propagating from an artery right under where you're listening. Here's the, here's the aorta. Here's the left main branch going down to the branch point to the left circumflex coronary artery. And then the left anterior descending, which is probably where 85% of heart disease will occur in the LAD. So that's going down into this image. And our array wraps around that, and we work all those triangulization problems between each pair of sensors and all the points on the artery. And this square right here is the volume over which we're working the imaging. Okay, it's a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cube. And it's resolved to a quarter of a centimeter. So this is not a high resolution image. We're not like imaging the interface between two different types of tissue. You have to hold your breath. And we let the patient do that. We give the patient a button, hold your breath, push the button. And we like to go 20 seconds, but a lot of people can't do that. It just makes processing easier and you don't have to store as much data. But the button's a good deal. Oh. Well, you have to take each position of the sensor. I mean, it's in, it's in the processing algorithm. Because what you do is you let it conform, then you do a measurement on the deformation from, from linear. And, and since it's piecewise linear, it's not, it's not that bad. No. You know what I do, though? And it doesn't seem to make a difference. I put a piece of saran wrap. Saran wrap is, is very skin-like, you know, and it's millimeters thick. And, and that, it seems to help with ground problems, electromagnetic stuff. And it keeps the thing clean, too. You, know, you don't have to wash it with alcohol three times a day. And it makes it all reusable. All right, moving on. Okay, so here's, here's this problem. I'm going to blow this up and, and look at the heart only and in diagram form. So here we are sitting out here with, with the array of stethoscopes. 
and it's about three and a half centimeters to the, for, a, for a, an adult male, three and a half centimeters to the front side of the heart. And the left main artery, the aorta is somewhere in here, and the left main artery starts out at the base of the aorta and goes down, and then it branches into the left circumflex, and then the LAD, the left anterior descending, goes, drops down along the front of the heart. Heart disease likes to go here first, it seems. It can't, you can find it on the posterior. Right now, we haven't placed this on anybody's back to try and hear in from the back on the, on the posterior side. We're concentrating on the LAD. So what makes turbulence? This is kind of the progression of, of heart disease. In the upper left is a healthy artery, probably a teenager, but maybe not in this day and age. We don't know what they eat most of the time. And the lines of flow are par parallel and straight ahead. And that's called laminar flow. The flow lines are not interfering with each other. And then along about, we think, I think, about age 30, these things start to appear, these deposits of lipid and inflammation. The, the lipids start to deposit themselves in the wall of, of the artery. The body says, I don't like that, and it starts to attack these lipid deposits, and that causes inflammation. And then sometimes those lipids, the cover over those lipid pockets will rupture, and the person has a heart attack, because all the stuff that's inside comes out. You don't want that to happen. So you've got to hear the result of, of these occlusions into the blood flow that causes turbulence, which has a component of the flow which is perpendicular to the wall. And with that fluid and turbulence hitting the wall, it causes vibration. The wall is elastic, and the sound waves propagate out as elastic waves. This can happen. You can have distributed heart disease. You can have a number of these occlusions, and of course, all kinds of turbulence, and then at the end, when the velocity picks up again, you get the vertical component hitting the wall and, and making vibration sounds. The most insidious type of heart disease is one that doesn't interrupt the flow very much, but it grows outward from the artery, so-called non-occluding lesion. And Unfortunately, this wall here can become very thin in non-occluding lesions, and that's dangerous. But what's also going on here is a hardening and a stiffening of the artery wall and the growth of something called boundary layer turbulence. If there's boundary layer turbulence and any kind of roughness at all under this non-occlusive lesion, you'll get distributed boundary layer turbulence, and you can hear that. It's going to be a tough problem, though. And we're not there to where we have a concentrated program to hear that kind of turbulence. We need to really cooperate with clinical people, because they're aware of this type of heart disease. So how did we learn how noisy these things can be? We did it with a pork loin roast that was about three centimeters thick, and we didn't eat it afterwards. Here's a latex tube, very much like a coronary artery, and it goes under the pork loin, and we put an occluder in there, a little ring disc, and we allowed 25% of the blood flow by cross-sectional area to come through. And it made a noise, and we put our device on top, and I'll show you some pictures of that here in a moment. And what did we hear? Now here's a plot, I apologize. This is sound level versus the speed of flow. That's how we varied the strength of the turbulent noise, just by varying the speed of flow. And here is what we heard along this 
speed trajectory when there was no occluder in there, no artificial occluder. When we put the occluder in, that level started to jump at a very low flow rate. This is what really gives us hope for this pre-symptomatic detection of CAD, that we can begin to detect as low as 20, 25 centimeters per second that there's a blockage. We don't have to wait to get out here when the levels are high enough to, to be 75 or 90 percent blocked. We, we, do ge we, we generate a blockage score. It has nothing to do with calcium other than calcium may be the cause of it or related to it. And you'll see the score sheet here in a minute. We've been doing human data now for like 10 years. But generally, what's going on here? Let's look at the sound pressure level from a coronary artery with a blockage. So the percent blockage is along this horizontal axis and the sound level produced is along this. Now, this is not an exact curve, but it's, it's what I just referred to. Where is the early detection threshold before symptomatic? Generally, the, the cardiology field says 75 percent blockage. You'll start to feel that. You could have angina. You could have pain. You could have shortness of breath with a 75 percent by diameter blockage. That's when they start testing you, not until you're symptomatic. Suppose for $20 a test, we could detect at a, at a very low percentage of blockage. And this is where we're estimating right now based on our human data and our lab tests, our bench tests, 30 to 45 percent. It's estimated that in Western civilization, that can occur as early as 20, 30 years old. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have some. But I'm not, that's what I'm going to gloss over here so we can finish. But, but you'll, you'll know what we're not talking about. You'll see the. How about, how about that? I'll go for that. Okay. Okay. I think we could start to move a little faster here. Okay, this is what our data looks like. We record at all 15 sensors. We synchronize all of those heartbeats that we have recorded in two minutes. That is, we can stack them right on top of each other. And this shows you, I think this, this particular cut has like 90 heartbeats that were synchronized and overlapped. Phase lock loop, people. Anybody, any engineers here? That's how FM radio works phase lock loop to get synchronized. So we synchronize all of those heartbeats. Here's the diastolic interval. Here is lub, dub, diastole. Lub, dub, diastole. And that's this interval. These little things could be heart disease or they could be valve, these little bumps down here. So we want to dig in and find out. So we break this interval. The problem is the heart is a moving target. It's always changing every instant. So we look at a gated window. Think of strobing. You know how when you take a picture of a train, of the old wagon wheels on stagecoaches? When I was a kid, anyhow. If the camera is taking pictures that's related integer-wise to the rotation of the wheel, it'll freeze the wheel. And that's what we're doing here. So we can look across, let's say, 80 heartbeats, all the way down the ensemble of heartbeats, and we can do time averaging. Remember I said time averaging is tool number three? So we don't have to be satisfied with one beat at a time. We can average over the whole ensemble. So we're getting the use of the 15 stethoscopes plus two minutes of heart sound that all sound like it's happening at the same time because we've synchronized these intervals. And we do that in four intervals, early diastole, mid-early, mid-late, and late diastole. So we get four maps of the 
noise field generated by the heart, each heartbeat. Here's where the spectrogram, the first thing we do is a spectrogram. Let me see if I can amplify this, because this is really interesting. This actually worked, not like my example today. Okay, yeah, this is cool. <laughs> so you have time on the vertical and frequency on the horizontal. And you can see the markers every 120 cycles. So we use that as, as marker. This is a stomach gurgle. See this? Rrrp, rrrp, rrrp. That's in slow motion, that's what a gurgle. So we have to get rid of that. And if we look in this interval right here, depending on how much this is filled in, this is where the brewery caused by either a valve or a blockage in diastole. It's one or the other. Otherwise, this is pretty clean. If the blood flow is laminar, you don't see much in here. And you occasionally get a heartbeat that is cleaner than another. It's not bad here, but this stuff here is worrisome. Let's see. Okay, we focus beamform, we focus the image, and we get stuff that looks like this. Again, this image is distorted. But we get, we get 40 of these images, one at each depth slice. And no cardiologist is going to take the time to page through all of these slices at different depths, believe me. They want a number, or they want an image that's concentrated. So let me get out of the expansion mode here. We present first what we call the fishbowl display. So this is a display of the peak values in that noise measurement. And we circle them. This happens to be right over the coronary, the left anterior descending coronary. And this is the left circumflex making this. So what the indication here is, is that right under intercostal space four, there's a blockage and the branch point is close by and there's something going on in the left circumflex. And sure enough, this guy, four weeks later, had four stents put in, two of them in the left circumflex and two of them in the LAD. He had already been through diagnosis, so he knew he was, he was going in for stents in, in a couple of weeks. So verification, I don't know. We think it's a validation of, of our theory. Different person. And here's stuff that's, that's really a giveaway. See this? Lub, lub, dub, shh. Now that turns out to be a valve. This person, according to our depth image, did not have severe coronary artery disease. This was the mitral valve that has, the leaflets of which have been calcifying. So calcification of a, of a mitral valve means you get little barnacles. I mean, that's the only way to think of it. They're little barnacles of calcium that grow on the leaflet, the tip of the leaflet. And as the blood rushes over that, it makes a shh sound that's indistinguishable if you only look at the frequency if you only look at this level. And of course, it occurs during the diastolic interval when the heart is refilling, when the ventricle is refilling. Okay. So we take all that information, I'm not gonna tell you how we do it, but we can measure the strength of all those points. And we tabulate them across frequency and each of those four time slots that I talked about, if you remember. And we give a score to each one of those for 
a shallow event or a deep event. If it's a shallow event, less than five centimeters, we attribute that to an artery on the front of the heart. If it's around three, three and a half, it's not coming from inside the heart. It's right on the surface of, of the anterior surface. So we make a big deal of short versus deep. The deep is probably the valve. So this person has both artery blockage and valve blockage because we, our typical threshold on these numbers now is about 0.25. I won't tell you how we get the numbers, but it's a score based on the strength of the responses that we're getting from focusing. Engineers are geeks, and they like those numbers, but I'm not going to inflict those on you. So where are we now? And this could be the last, maybe second to last few graphs. We've got a total of about 125 independent data sets. And we have 125 data sets, and of those, 80 of them, maybe a few more, 82 in blue, were no CAD detected when there was, in fact, no CAD. So we're correctly not detecting CAD when it's not there. That's called specificity in the medical world. When we had CAD, we detected it almost 100% of the time. Sensitivity. Sonar people call that detection. Detection probability. So these are called histograms that give the number of counts that we had this event and the number of counts where we had this event. And we put this data together when we get up to five or 600 or even 1,000 data sets. And we have what's called a, re, a receiver operation curve, receiver performance operational curve. And then we can use that to pick a good threshold to decide whether we go CAD in our decision or no CAD. So that's where we are. We're starting down this road of basically clinical trial. Testing a, a, a medical device is not the same as testing a pharmaceutical. FDA rules for medical devices aren't as severe as pharmaceuticals. In fact, we already have FDA approval for human testing with this device. They liked what we were doing. It's a type one device. It doesn't risk anybody's life when you put it on somebody and take data. So the FDA said, go ahead, you're all set. We'll record that you talked to us on such and such a date. And so we're good to go there. The only thing we can't do is put it on the market and allow cardiologists to start using it and making diagnoses. That's when it becomes life threatening. If, it, if the device doesn't work and you're telling, giving people bad information, FDA doesn't want that. So we're not there yet. And if we get to that point, we'll uh, probably be pre-commercial at that point. We'd be ready to start selling the device. Okay, I'm finished. Last few graphs. Where are we on time? Okay. 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 So I've shown how we use the spectrogram. I hope you got a sense for that. I've shown how focal point beamforming is so important to, to resolve ambiguities in what we hear. You've got to know where the sound is coming from, not just that there's something there that can be heard. That little company was, that builds a smart stethoscope learned that the hard way. And in fact, what they were calling was valve noise when they got their false detection. That's why they missed one out of three. And they were sending people into, cardio into angiography unnecessarily. So our status is that we really believe we have the, the pieces of the puzzle to do screening for coronary artery disease, starting as people in their youth, 20s. 
teenagers. I mean, we don't know what kids' hearts, arteries look like in this day and age. I think we have an idea of what they eat, and it's not always good. But heart disease is a continuum. If you have fat on your body, you have fat in your arteries. It's not like, oh, no heart disease, bang, someday, heart disease. It starts to grow and grow and grow, and some, at some point it becomes symptomatic. Yeah. They, they go away. Ultrasound is cheap, but the only way you can image inside a coronary artery with ultrasound is by a technique developed by Dr. Nissen at Cleveland Clinic. It's called IVUS, intravascular ultrasound. It takes a catheter. You have to put the sonar, trans the transmitter for the ultrasound and the receiver on the end of a catheter and slide it into the artery that you want to image. No, I'm not. I don't, uh, the acronym is, oh, it's for the carotid, yeah, we're, that's easy. Yeah, ultrasound, ultrasound, yeah, okay, I've seen those results. Yeah, you can actually image the topography of a lesion with ultrasound without invading. I mean, when you're close and you're not deep and you've got something making that much noise, you can hear it with your ear almost. Ultrasound allows you to image. You're right. I didn't realize it had an acronym. That's, I, that's what. Yeah. Oh, ultrasound. Well, I said deep. Deep deepness kills ultrasound. If you're trying to resolve inside the artery, there's, there's just too much hash. It won't work. Well, again, it depends on where our threshold is. Okay, let's go back. I think the answer to that question is in this histogram, okay? Yeah, this guy right here is the overlapping, okay, is the overlapping region. If we set a threshold of 0.25, we would have called two cases out of 130 no CAD, okay? Because if this is a threshold for no CAD, it's going to work a lot, a lot of the time. So, but when, we, when these histograms really start to, to fill out, we'll get a better picture of how they're distributed. And, and yeah. This, this would not quantify as a clinical trial yet. There's not enough sample size. It's not power to do what we need to do. We collect raw data. Uh, well, uh, we wouldn't do it. That, the way we envision this thing being a commercial product is it would be done in your primary care office. Okay, wouldn't even ha could be done by a technician. No, that right in the beginning we'd want that to be sent to a central site because we want that data. That's a clinic. That's a clinical trial. If 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 we've sold a few com commercial devices, we want to hear the data coming back. Maybe someday when we know what the data means, we won't have to do that exchange. But right now, it's, it's about, we, we take about 200 megabytes for two minutes of data. And I mean, that goes to the central site and processed and back in minutes. It's what? Well, that's the last point. I'm not going to say why this happens. It could be stubbornness on our part in coming to terms with, with clinical people. Um, it could be stubbornness on, on their part. You need big money to run a clinical trial. You need millions. 
if you go to a place like Cleveland Clinic and you get the cardiologist excited and you ask them, will you work with us? And they'll say yes. They'll say yes. And, but bring your pocketbook. Okay. We don't at this point, this, we're developing this. Okay. We don't at this point, ha we haven't sought big money yet because we really want to validate it on a validation trial size, which is maybe 10 to 30 patients. We're looking for a cardiologist who would enjoy the science and doing 10 to 30 patients, comparing beat by beat what he's getting with best practice and what we're showing. Now, we've done that, but have we validated it? We've got five or six patients that we know what's wrong with them. And we say, yes, this is, this is what we see. We'd like to do that with 10 to 30 patients. Then the path would be to bypass an, a middle development stage and go directly to a Medtronics or somebody big that can build this thing commercially right off the bat. They'd be taking a risk. A validation trial of 30 people is it's still a small trial. And, but when it gets commercial, then you have all this data coming back, thousands of data sets, and then you've got, you've got what you need to really tell how the device is working. But that's, that's five to ten million dollars to, to pay for something like that. And what NIH recommends is to do that once you've gone commercial. If, if you don't have ten million dollars or you don't want to give away the shop, you can start selling the device and take the data and produce your own clinical trial. So that's kind of the middle road we're taking. But we do need partners. You know, we do need people that are interested in the science and the potential here. Yeah, good question. Um, I think in production, probably less than $500, plus a laptop. The laptop would be the expensive part. And the laptop does the streaming of the data. So you have, a, you have the sensor device, and then you have an A to D system, which is about $1,500, and that couples into a laptop. So you got like $3,000 of commercial stuff, A to D system, and uh, but the sensor itself, I think we could build that for $500. And everything else is off the shelf. Of course, there are 10,000 li lines of code, mat what they call MATLAB code, to do the imaging. That's, that's, that's none of us ever got paid a penny to do that, other than we had some, some interest in, the, in 2000. Somebody wanted to go fast on this thing, and it wasn't ready. I'll admit that. There's been a lot of money spent on this, and it was too early, too much too soon. Because people were excited about the potential of it. And we didn't have a clinical tool at that time. And it didn't take long for Cleveland Clinic to figure that out. And, and they were right. They were absolutely right. So money can get ahead of science sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Connectivity, TE. The connectivity, they're a connector house, but they do a lot more. They do transducers. and Actually, the PVDF, you know where you've all seen it? It's in s shoes, kids' shoes, where the lights go. When they step on it, it produces a voltage and makes a light. It's the same material. That's the biggest market for it. We have eight patents. We have it really nailed down. Yeah, we just had one issued uh, in October. It started back when I was still at the Navy. I, I should tell you the story. We were, did I tell you about Yale? So we had seminars with Yale, and when the Cold War was over, enlightened people at the Pentagon said, you know, we really have a lot of technology here. 
why don't we see if we could transfer some of it to the economy instead of just DOD? And it just turned out that we were talking with people at Yale and having exchanging seminars and things like that in the engineering and medical area. And they said, we cannot early detect CAD. So that's when I first heard the problem. And I started to think about what could we do with sonar? So this, the genesis of this is 25 years old. In two years, we had two patents that have already expired. We had proven the we had proven the feasibility by 1978, and we had first heard about it in, in 1995. But then I had to go away and retire. Um, and then I had another five-year stint doing some R&D stuff. So in 2005, I started really getting serious because it just bothered me that in 2001, we were told it wasn't working. And in 2000, between 2005 and 2008, we did a lot of good work. And we had two more patents in 2008. And the company was sworn, Phonoflow. And there's been a stream of them since then. We try and nail it down pretty well. And even with the pa expired patents, there are ways the lawyers figure out to circle the wagon around expired stuff, you know. Oh, well, you did this additional amount. You should patent that. And that sort of puts a wall of troopers around your original work, because they can't get to the use the original patent if they don't really know how to use what you originally patent. Because now you have a new patent. Pharmaceuticals know how to do that pretty well. And instead of 20 years, a patent becomes more like 30. We would like to do people with risk factors. Yeah. So risk factors don't include symptoms. Okay? You don't have to be already sick. You just have to have the condition. Two thirds of Americans are overweight. Half of those are obese. I would say of the five primary risk factors, if you had two of them, you should probably start doing this test. Exactly. Um, that's why we wouldn't start screening. We would start with patients who are already under care or are just coming into care. Somebody walks in with pain and shortness of breath, let's start our best practice. So we would work with that hospital or that clinical group, and we do our side-by-side -side comparison offline and compare to them step-by-step. -step. And we would do that for as many patients as they would have, as the cardiologists would have patients working with us. I don't mean patient as in person, I mean if they have the time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Really did appreciate you all coming. It's been.